So this is not my usual place that I record podcasts, but I've got a very interesting story to tell everybody today. So I'm actually in the waiting lounge of the emergency room of my local hospital. I had to come here because I got uh, an injury. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's gonna be an interesting one. And so I'm just kind of waiting and hanging with you guys. Um, I know in a previous episode, I recently talked about how you should be telling stories about scars and not wounds. Well, uh, I think today's episode is gonna be a story about a wound, which I got earlier this morning. And just a fair warning, I don't wanna make this episode too much blood and guts, but it does contain a very grisly injury. And by the way, this podcast might have some stops and starts because, uh, you know, I am in a, like a public hospital and I wanna protect other people's privacies. But yeah, so this morning I was finished with my morning chores. I went inside to make a cup of coffee and I have this like pour over coffee machine. Like it's not even a machine, it's like a, I don't know, a vase or a carafe that you use to pour the hot water over the grounds and then it drips in and makes just a delicious cup of coffee. The Asoba Porova is a modern, all-in-one, insulated pour-over coffee maker. But the problem with this coffee maker is that, like, it comes in, like, three parts and the top part is made of glass. And so I was unscrewing the glass part as I was trying to wash it and it, like, has this tendency that when the hot coffee goes on it, it like uh, loosens, so you retighten it so you can pour it, but then when the pot cools down, it like, it gets stuck. And so I'm in the sink, washing it, trying to unscrew the top part from the plastic part and screw, trying, trying, and like struggling to pull it. And then pow, the whole piece of glass cracks. And I pretty much sliced off the tip of my uh, ring finger here on my right hand. Immediately, blood went everywhere. I called for my wife, Allison. She came running down. And now my wife, mind you, she's not the faint of heart when it comes to blood. And she's actually used to this type of thing. She actually works as a nurse practitioner in an emergency room of a hospital. Not this hospital specifically, but, you know, a hospital nearby, a different one. And so she took a look at it and said immediately that I was going to need some serious number of stitches to repair this because... Let me just tell you, friends, and I'll maybe show this in the video version of this podcast. My index fingertip was just hanging by a flap of skin. Like, I hacked the whole thing off with that piece of glass. And so she got out her medical kit and quickly bundled me up, but she didn't feel comfortable trying to do the sutures at home, and she said I needed to go to the emergency room. Spread your fingers apart. Thank you, love. You know where I didn't want to go today? The hospital? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's your day off too i was gonna say like you know you worked your shift yesterday you thought you were done for a week and didn't have to do anything and so with my finger all bundled up i hopped in the car and drove now some of you guys might be wondering well, why didn't she come with me and i knew that this whole experience was going to take a little bit of time and so i didn't want to make her burn her entire morning because she's been working at the emergency room for like i don't know the last two or three days and to make her have to come on her off day and hang out in the emergency room just felt cruel. And she did such a good job wrapping it all up. Um, I was pretty much able to drive. And so I hopped in the truck and you know drove the, I don't know, 25 minutes or so that it takes to get here. And so now I'm here and I'm sitting in the waiting room. Now, folks might say that's a weird instinct to immediately turn on your recorder and start trying to record a podcast episode. But I actually had a podcast episode planned that I was going to record today. And I am pretty certain that given how much time that this is going to take, I'm not going to have the chance to do it. And so I've decided to go for a plan B. And guess what? This episode is going to be the plan B, which is me just hanging out in the emergency room. I mean, I don't know. I think it's kind of an interesting place to hang out. I've had a handful of experiences over the years going to an emergency room. Um, I think the first time I actually remember it, like I'm pretty sure my mom took me like when I was a baby once for like an ear problem or something or like maybe a cough. But like the first injury I ever remember having to go to the emergency room for was I was in third grade and I was playing a baseball game in my local little league. I was running from 
second, actually I was on first base. There was a hit out into the outfield. I ran past second base, was rounding second, heading towards third. And as I was heading towards third, I tripped and I landed right on my wrist and I immediately felt a very sharp shooting pain. On top of that sharp shooting pain though, might I add, I also remember thinking that the kid who was playing shortstop tripped me. And it's funny too, because he to this day is actually still a friend of mine. Um, uh, I'll just call him Mike for now, because I have a lot of friends named Mike from that era. So I'll leave him somewhat uh, anonymous. But yeah, he to this day insisted that he never tripped me, didn't mean to do it, but I still, I still think he might have did because he's a wicked competitive kid, and I was a wicked competitive kid, and we were on opposite teams. And even though we were friends, you know, there's, I don't know, I, I just wonder, did he do it? Did he, did he accidentally do it? For whatever reason, though, I tripped on the infield, landed on my wrist, and cracked it. Like uh, it was actually on my left wrist, like right about here, right where the hospital bracelet is, and got, I think, what was called a buckle fracture, and uh, had to get a cast. And I remember immediately going with my dad to the emergency room still in my little league baseball outfit and waiting there for a couple of hours before getting seen and uh yeah that was i think the first time i ever remember going to a hospital for something for myself like i'd been there to visit like i remember visiting my grandmother when she was sick i remember um, visiting my sister because my sister had to go to the hospital a few different times i remember I don't know. I think that I, I like I said, I, my mom, she actually worked at a hospital because she was a nurse um, at a number of times. I remember going to see her at work before, but that time when I broke my wrist was the first time I ended up in the emergency room. The first time I ever ended up in a hospital. But obviously, as I sit here now as a 43 year old man, that was not the last time. Shortly after I stopped recording, a very nice woman came and got me. She was bringing me to go get x-rayed. Many faces at you. <laughs> I was gonna say it's quite the hall of portraits uh -huh. going here. And thank you for being patient if you had to wait for me. Right? Oh, it's all good. I can occupy myself. Oh. God, my joints look weird. They're beautiful. <laughs> So the good news was that the x-ray found that there were no foreign bodies, like say a little broken shard of glass inside my finger. That meant that they were gonna be able to seal me up pretty quickly. I gotta say, I'm very surprised with how quickly everything's moving along here. This is very, very nice to see. Now I'm set up in a room and uh, I've got my finger soaking in a bowl and it's getting cleaned up. Um, it really hurt when the bandage got taken off initially that Allison put on. But uh, now that it's sitting in this water, it's actually very nice and relaxing. So I'm just kind of chilling out. Hello. Hey there. So I have to give you a T-dap. Oh, I'm sorry. What's tetanus. That? Oh, okay. Tetanus booster. Whenever you get a cut like the one I got, it's important to know if you have a tetanus shot. Tetanus is an infection caused by a bacteria, and that bacteria can produce a toxin that causes painful muscle contractions. You cannot open your mouth, yeah. do you? Yeah. 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 So, always know if you have a tetanus shot or not. I wasn't exactly sure when my last tetanus shot was, so I decided to get an extra one just in case. Two, three. Hold on. There's. Thank you. Given that I'm always working with gnarly, gross, rusted metal and stuff anyway, I feel like it's it's better to be safe than sorry on that one. So what you just witnessed there was me getting my tetanus shot. And then the other thing that they did was they came in and they um, put my finger in this like little liquid bath that had like lidocaine and some other stuff. So it's like a little pain number thing. Um, my finger now feels wonderful. Like it, I barely even notice that if there's a problem and uh, the doctor's going to come back and stitch me up in just a minute. So... I don't know, this might be faster than I thought it was gonna be, but it does remind me of the second time I ever really went to the hospital. And uh, you know, that was, I was in college at the, that time. And it's, this is, I, I've told this story in a video before, but I'll tell it again, cause it's a grisly one. So one beautiful fall afternoon in Boston, uh, some friends and I were hanging out. Uh, my friend Pat had his car and we were driving around town and we decided to go to the reservoir in Brookline. 
and we were like going down to the reservoir, but there was this big black metal, like wrought iron fence that surrounded the reservoir, at least the side that we were on. There's like a gate on the other side, but we were lazy and we didn't want to like walk around it. And so what we decided to do was we were going to hop the fence. And so, you know, Pat went over and Landon went over and Adam went over. And when it came to be my turn to jump the fence, I like climbed up one side. And again, this is like a five foot high wrought iron metal fence. And it had like the big spiky posts on the top of it. And so I climbed up the fence on, on the side that I was getting over And I was kind of almost standing on the top of the fence to like jump over it. But as I jumped, my shoelace got hooked on the wrought iron metal fence. It pulled me over, swung me around. And I don't even know how to say this without like really giving somebody the heebie-jeebies. And take that meat and just thread it onto the skewers. The wrought iron metal fence actually went like through Like, because I was wearing high top sneakers, it went just above like where my high top sneaker was, went through my ankle and stabbed all the way through the bottom of my foot because the force and momentum of me falling just drove that spike like right through my foot. So it was like in through the ankle, poking out the bottom of my foot. But my friends couldn't quite see what was going on. They thought I just got my shoe stuck on it. And so uh, my one friend who was still on the other side of the fence kind of like pushed my foot off and I fell down and landed on the ground. And when he was pushing my foot off, he was basically pushing the wrought iron metal thing back through the other way. So it was like almost like, you know, like pulling out, you know, it it was rough. And there I was with a, you know, severe puncture wound through my foot on the wrong side of the fence. And I eventually had to climb over the fence, get to the other side, and my friends it immediately like rushed me to the emergency room at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And that was the second time I, I, I ever got um, into the emergency room. Whew, and that one was rough. I was there for, I was probably there for like 10 hours. And um, I forget even how many stitches it was. It was like north of 50. I don't want to misquote it. I have it written down somewhere in a journal of some sort or sketchbook, but I got a crazy number of stitches. I couldn't walk for weeks. I had to keep my ankle elevated. I had to do physical therapy. It was like I had dressings that I had to pack and unpack and like was looking for tissue granulation. It was, it was, it was the worst injury I've ever received in my entire life. No question about it. Um, You know, and, and that was, I don't know, probably 23, 24 years ago. And to this day, it remains, yeah, the grisliest thing I've ever experienced, the worst pain I've ever experienced, everything. Like all of my superlatives for kind of worst related to injuries and and kind of physical ailment all are linked back to that wound. And, you know, I still have like scars of it today. Like you can see the scar of where the post went in through my ankle. And then you can also see the uh, scar where like it actually was poking out the bottom of my foot. It's, it's, It's pretty nuts. As people are prone to do, I recovered. And uh, other than that, I haven't had a lot of trips to the hospital. Um, There was one incident when I was in my 20s when I had to actually take somebody to the hospital. And uh, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it's actually a situation I don't even think I should be talking about now. I'm just not comfortable talking about, so I'm just going to blow past it. And as I think about the inventory of other times, I mean, like I had shoulder surgery and that wasn't like an emergency room trip, but that was a trip. And then like one time I had to get a endoscopy. But other than that, I've, I've been a very lucky person in not having to go to the hospital. And so, yeah, this right here is a rare instance of me kind of doing my thing at a hospital, um, which is unusual. I just say uh, the folks here at this hospital have been super, super nice and super, super pleasant. And things are moving really fast along. Um, I'm not sure if I should say the name of the hospital. So I'm just not going to say the name of the hospital because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. It's actually really cool. Like everybody I've asked say, hey, do you mind if I continue recording this podcast? And they're like, yeah, go for it, whatever. Just don't show other patients. And (laughs) so, um, yeah, I've been really pleased with this experience. It's kind of nice to know that like the closest hospital to the farm is like a really nice and friendly hospital. I will say, you know, and I I hear so many stories from Allison too, which kind of shapes my worldview on this. 
you know, the hospital systems and the way the healthcare system in our uh, country right now continues to just make me scratch my head and just, I have no idea what this trip is going to cost. And, and we have health insurance through Allison's job. And so that'll help some. And I think we've already hit our deductible for the year, so that'll help too. But yeah, there's definitely going to be some sort of bill involved. And I actually genuinely wonder, and, and, uh, I might do this in a subsequent episode because I know I'm not going to have the information before I have to post this, but, uh, I wonder what that bill is going to look like and what the itemized costs are because so many of them, like when you look at the numbers these days, and I know so many people have done YouTube videos and there's been news reports about like ridiculous costs in the American healthcare system. It really has me, you know, wonder like, what's this one going to cost? I, I think one of the reasons why I believe it's not the one of the reasons it's, it's a reason. So I guess, let me just put this one on the table here. I know this is a very politically charged statement. I know that I try not to delve too deeply into pot- politics on this podcast, but given that the topic at hand today, quite literally, is the U.S. healthcare system and my experience with it, I, I feel like it's important to say that I do believe that um, the United States should shift to like a single payer uh, federalized healthcare system where, you know, it's just treated as a human right. And, you know, for folks in America here, you get your health care, um, you know, essentially by nationalizing the system, you can, number one, drive down costs significantly because the crazy system that we have between health insurers and, you know, the medical institutions and how everything operates is just so gosh darn convoluted. And it's not to say that I truly believe in government bureaucracy or anything like that, but I do believe that there is a certain power in having, you know, stronger negotiating and bargaining rights with medical suppliers, with pharmaceutical companies, with, um, you know, other healthcare uh, kind of resources. And when you look at how things happen today, you know, you can't ask somebody like, how much does it cost to get an x-ray? Because you'll find like 25 different prices. And, and I think actually simplifying that and removing the complexity and removing the levels of administration. And I mean, look, let's just pick the, pick on the healthcare insurance industry. Number one, here you have an entire entity that doesn't actually even operate significantly like insurance. Like if you look at car insurance or you look at life insurance, right? Essentially, what you have are pools of risk, and if you want to participate in that pool of risk, you have to essentially assume that you're going to have certain levels of, of, of premium cost. And so if you're a riskier driver, you're going to have riskier factors there. If your health's not great, you're going to have uh, you know higher premiums that you have to pay for your life insurance policy. And so like those premises make sense, and I can see how pooled risk can create both a protection opportunity for many, many different people who might need it, but who are not going to experience that problem at a significant frequency. But then you're going to also have the opportunity for a company to actually be able to operate and even drive a profit. And and like, I I can see how it can be a win-win for everybody, like say with life insurance or car insurance. The reason I struggle with the premise of health insurance is everybody needs healthcare, number one. Not everybody's going to have significant, expensive, catastrophic costs, but the probability of that declines significantly over a period of time, and it's not like you don't need it. And so, like again, I'm going to compare it to life insurance, right? You know, if you're a 40 year old person and you need life insurance and you're you know reasonable health, you're going to pay a specific premium, and it. it kind of mathematically works out. And and then when you're 80 years old, your need for life insurance isn't that high. And so nobody's going to really insure an 80 year old with life insurance. But again, you don't really need life insurance, like in what it can provide when you're 80 years old, or it's not, not necessarily as critical as somebody say who's 40 and has a family and a lot of financial liabilities. Healthcare, you know, it doesn't matter if you're 40 or if you're 80, you're going to need health care. And for that 80 year old, that health care is going to be expensive. And, you know, particularly as new drugs, new innovations keep happening and opportunities keep coming up, that stuff's going to continue to be there. And so to treat health care like a pooled risk, it just doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Like 
it's an inevitability that we will all get sick and die. Like, unless <laughs> I mean, I like the odds of me growing old and having illnesses and having healthcare costs absent something tragic happening are very high. Like, it's what happens to everybody. It, it is a very rare exception that somebody could live to be 100 years old, and not need any significant amount of health care, and then just drop dead. Like, that does, doesn't really happen. And so to assume that health care in and of itself is something that you can have pooled risk for, I don't know. That just doesn't make any sense for me. So that's number one. And then number two, when you start to look at the fact that if you had a single payer, you had a single buyer, you had somebody who is essentially looking at the cost of inputs as well as what's there, and you can actually regulate it like you regulate like a, an energy utility, essentially, I think it, it only makes sense to run our healthcare that way. And I think so many folks are profiting right now by the patchwork confederacy that exists for how healthcare is provided in the United States this day and age, that there's all these little, you know, essentially vampires of, of financial um, incentive, like kind of sucking blood off that healthcare system without necessarily having it be a net benefit for the patient or the, you know, people of the United States of America. And, and so that also feels like a reason too. And so even hold aside your biases of, of, you know, not believing that healthcare is a right for everybody. Even if you just think of those two pieces alone, I feel like it's a very logical argument for a single payer healthcare system. Now I know there's going to be chuckleheads in the comments who go off and off on the idea that, um, you know, oh, just wait, the government doing it, that's going to be awful. People in Canada hate their healthcare system. People in the UK hate their healthcare system. The reality is, yeah, there's gripes and yeah, it's imperfect, but it is objectively better than the system that we have here in the United States of America. You know, given that I'm kind of sitting here waiting in an emergency room, uh, patient treatment room right now, I don't think I'm going to be able to pull up the stats to give it to you, but maybe I'll flash something on screen or cut into this while I'm editing. But I can just say it is objectively better than what we have in the United States of America. I'm not saying like, say the UK system is perfect. I'm just saying it is better. And I, I really question why we don't try to move towards that. I think another thing that just completely baffles me is this idea that your health insurance needs to be tied to your employment. And this is something that's actually very much become apparent to me as a, a you know person who's essentially self-employed now, even though for you know last 20 years before that, I was essentially working jobs and had employer provided health insurance. Like, you know, the idea that you don't even have health insurance or you can't access that health insurance really makes me wonder, like, well, you know, then what's the incentive for somebody to want to become a small business owner or start their own business? Like, you know, it actually becomes a way to discourage that type of activity. Yet, if I hear like so much of the rhetoric of, of you know, kind of small business powering America, um, it seems counterintuitive that we would be so focused on discouraging that. <sighs> but I digress. And these are the things I, I whine about as I wait to get my finger stitched up here. Get out of here before I smash your head and you coming. So since I'm killing time waiting here, I decided to look at coffee pots. Ever since I quit my job just to work on the farm full time, I have for some reason become obsessed with drinking coffee. Like it's not something I was ever all that into. Like growing up, I didn't like coffee at all. I just thought it was gross. By the time I got to college, I would occasionally drink coffee. Um, but what I would do is, is basically only drink it in an emergency. Like, like if I like really needed to pull an all nighter or like, I really needed to like, you know, drive a crazy long distance, I would like drink coffee, but that would be it. And pretty much throughout all of adulthood, that was my relationship with coffee. It was like a, a necessity only. It was not something I enjoyed, but when I left my day job and I just started working on the farm full time. I started to develop this ritual that I always enjoyed where I would go out each morning, do my chores, get like the basics of the day going. And then, you know, by mid morning or early morning, I would like, I don't know, say like nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, I'd come inside, have a cup of coffee, take like a little relax and then go either back outside and work on the task of the project of the day or go up to my office and do office work. And so that's pretty much what I've always done. And so I've gotten really into making coffee. And, uh, yeah, I've, uh, got into like, uh, the pour overs types of things, uh, like pour over coffee. 
um, which I think it tastes the best. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Some people might argue a French press. I think the pour over is great. So now as I'm looking at my different options for coffee makers, let me just show you again what coffee maker I was using and uh, I will never use again. And it was actually funny too because I actually really liked this coffee maker. So actually what you're looking at right here, this is the coffee maker. Uh, let's see, I didn't have it in aqua pink. I had it in this... Uh, uh, it doesn't look like they have it. It was like a, I had this like special like black version of it, but it's basically, this is the coffee maker I was using. And so uh, this is the second one of these coffee makers that I've had. The other one, the glass piece broke as well. And so I just don't think it's right for me. And so I'm now looking at different coffee maker options uh, that are pour over. I don't know if anybody has any suggestions here. As I'm waiting again to get stitched up, this is probably also another very good time to suggest that if you are looking for a good book to read, might I suggest to you Toby Dog of Goldshaw Farm? I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, earlier this fall, I just released my first novel ever, and you can see it right here. It is Toby Dog of Goldshaw Farm. Um, there's a hardcover version. There is a paperback version. Um, both of those are, are just beautiful, love, lovely printed. There's a Kindle version that's available. And there's even an audible audiobook version where I read the story and I got some really talented actors to do the voices. And I'm just super, super proud of it. I can't believe too, like the ratings and reviews and like every, what everybody's been saying about it. Um, it really like means the world to me. Like I'm just looking at this one that just came in the other day from Altmed who says, uh, it's a five-star verified purchase. And they're saying best children's chapter book in a very long time and perhaps ever, which I don't think is probably the best ever, but I think it's a good one. So I don't know if you got a chance, check it out. Now I'm going to go get stitched up. <laughs> so yes, right in the middle of my commercial for the Toby dog book, the doctor came in and she was ready to stitch up my finger. The first thing she did was she applied some lidocaine to further numb the finger to make it less painful for when I got the actual stitches. And then it came time to do the work. Here, video about. Well, so usually I make videos about my farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, today though, I decided to make it about this. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so today it's just sort of t telling stories about different times I've gone to the emergency room and uh, you know, like just experiences. Cause usually anything I'm doing, even if it's on the farm, it's a story about like my life or something I experienced and just, you know, try to bring it to life for people. Cool. Yeah. What kind of farm do you have? I do uh, ducks, geese, cattle, pigs, trees, and bees. What's your favorite thing to grow or to uh, take care of? Either the cattle or the geese, surprisingly. <laughs> um, like cattle just, I don't know, I find them very serene and just love like moving them around. They're entirely grass fed, so just out on pasture. Yeah. Going from paddock to paddock. Um, so I love that. And then with the geese, they're like the most sustainable form of poultry. And so there's something just really nice about watching them. And they're just, you know, very graceful animals. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Wow. Look at that. With this flap, it's very thin. So this skin may not... Um, like live and survive, yep. but it's serving as a band-aid yep. um, for the skin underneath. And so it should start to heal. You should start to develop some new tissue under there um, and be fine. All right, well, I'm just gonna send the antibiotics and that's just for okay. prophylaxis, um, just cause you're um, out on farm. And yep, getting no, in the I, dirt and stuff. Well, I really appreciate it. I appreciate how fast you guys did this too. It's, I, I, I'm super impressed with that. Like I was expecting this to be like a day long activity. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, give me just a few minutes. Absolutely. Okay. I think it ended up being four stitches that I ended up having to get in total on my fingertip to keep it on. The doctor thinks that the skin that was cut might just end up dying and falling off and then things will grow up behind it and that's what will ultimately become the tip of my ring finger on my right hand. But we'll see and time will tell. I'm going to have to keep it wrapped and covered and the biggest risk I have now is infection. Like particularly working around the farm for the next few weeks you're going to see me wearing something dumb on my hand to help keep me protected but I think it's very medically necessary because I don't want to get this infected and I want to keep it clean. And so stay tuned for that and that's going to be fun. 
But I suppose all's well that ends well with my adventure here at the hospital today. I do got to say, I like, I like started recording this, expecting this to be a day long affair. I think I was in and out of there within, I don't know, it was a little bit over an hour. And I got to say, everybody was so friendly and kind and helpful. And I'm just really appreciative for the good local folks here at my local hospital for being able to take care of me and get me patched up nice and quick and have it not be an awful experience. And so to all of them, I really want to say thank you. I I genuinely appreciate it. And with that, I'll be back with another episode of the Goldshaw Farm podcast very soon. Thanks for listening, everybody. It's got a soul, this hero farm. Falls asleep inside my arms. We walk the fields under the stars. For love is here, Gold Shop Farm.